Thank you. It is great to be here. It's an honor uh, to stand up on this stage. And I want to say again, congratulations to the best plants, uh, all of you. I mean, it, it seems to me words come to mind like uh, quality, persistence, leadership, values, all those kinds of things that are so incredibly important, uh, required to build great organizations and, and to follow up on what what Gregory Babe was telling us this morning, you know, it's about the manufacturing base in this country. We're the future. And we need to get it right. And it seems to me that the people in this room are the ones that are going to do it. Uh, so thank all of you for what you do, day in and day out, uh, all day long, 24-07, three shifts, seven days a week in some cases, I'm sure, uh, to pump out that manufacturing capacity of our great country. It's terribly important. Uh, Today I want to talk to you for about uh, 35 minutes and then open it up for questions. And, and I want to talk about leadership. Uh, my views on what it means uh, to build a strong organization, what I think it takes based on my experience that goes back uh, to July of 1970 on the plains of West Point when I first started studying leadership. And, and then... Uh, in the Army, we were blessed with this great institutional training capability where every three or four years they sent officers or, or non-commissioned officers back to school to study leadership for six, eight, nine months at a whack. And you go back out in the Army and command formations in this wonderful leadership laboratory and you continue to revise and improve and develop your leadership style. You can't learn it in a book. It has to come through the school of hard knocks, trial and error to figure out what works best for you. And I think you'll see in the course of the next half hour or so what I think that means. Uh, here's the agenda. I want to talk a little bit about Klein Steel, uh, where we've been in the last five years, uh, because I think it's instructive. I think a lot of the leadership principles uh, that I learned in the military absolutely apply in business. There's a one-for-one -one correlation. They transfer directly. So I want to go through some of that and then set the stage for six uh, leadership principles that, again, have, have withstood the, pre the uh, test of time and I think make a lot of difference uh, that we all need to embrace and then open it up for questions. Um, I left the military in, in 2005, as Tom said, on principle. I left because... Guys like me, and there were a handful of us, you might recall 2006, 2007, pretty tough era, needed to, to put the uniform away, sadly, and get out and speak about our strategy, lack thereof, et cetera, et cetera. And there may be questions about that at the end of this presentation. I'd be happy to entertain them. It's about values. It's about integrity. It's about looking at yourself as a leader in the morning when you're shaving and saying, I can live with myself. Values. Here's, here's what it's all about. Your team. This is a picture of the team uh, of Klein Steel that's stationed in, in Rochester. It's the team. It's, it's what do you do as a leader uh, to motivate that team, to empower that team, to let loose the creative juices of that team. And believe me, that, that team right there can move mountains. Absolutely move mountains. Uh, in the last five years, we've done a lot of work as a team uh, to turn this battleship, to create a company, uh, an organization uh, founded on the principles of decentralization and empowerment, uh, allowing people to do what they do best. And, and there's a big role for the leader in all that, and I'll talk about that in the next half hour. But these are the kinds of things, I'm not going to read this list, you all can read it, but these are the kinds of things that a leader must do. And if, if, if you're turning the battleship, uh, boy, it, it is not for the, for the meek and the faint-hearted. Persistence really matters in this business called leadership. This vision, this knowing where you're going to go, and by God, you're going to get there. And there's a lot to that. And I'll go through all that in some detail as I get into the six leadership principles. This chart here, and I could pick any number of charts to show you the Klein Steel story. In my mind, this one right here says it all. It's safety. 
This chart shows you the Klein Steel loss ratio over the past five years in blue. Uh, we're a member of the Raffles Insurance Captive. Anybody else a member of Raffles? This incredible insurance captive. The whole idea is that if you have a great year and you don't have any accidents, you get the balance of your premium back in a dividend. Imagine that. Incredible. If you're interested, let me know. I'll help you out. Red is the 291 Raffles companies average for loss ratio. So you can see the story of Klein Steel. We started out in 2006 with an outrageous loss ratio of 150%. Surprised they even let us stay on the team. But you can see what we've done since then, year by year by year, getting it down to where at the end of March 2011, we finished the insurance year, our loss ratio was 7.9%. How do you do something like that? I look at that chart and I think about the six leadership principles that I'm about ready to talk about. Uh, I think about the requirement for persistence. You do not turn a battleship overnight. Believe me, I'm an impatient guy and I wanted that to happen fast. That's the best I could do. Persistence matters. You, gotta, you really got to set your goals and stay with it. Build the right team. Don't suffer fools. All these kinds of points uh, that, that are important, and I'll talk about it in a moment. But that chart there says it all. I could put up any number of indicators, you know, net profit, whatever. I could do a lot to show you, but that to me says it all. It's about safety. It's about discipline. It's about leaders being in charge. It's about team members being responsible for their actions. At Klein Steel, we don't have employees. We have team members. It's part of the psyche. This is a... This is a concept here that I want to go through because I think it's important. Uh, five years ago, I picked up on this in a Vistage group I'm a member of. Anybody else in the room part of Vistage International? What an incredible, incredible organization. I've got my own private uh, board of advisors and wonderful speakers come in. I needed it coming out of the military to help me get my head into business and understand how to make payroll and make money. But this concept resonated, and now, five years later, it, it is absolutely part of the fabric of, of Klein Steel, and it goes something like this, and I could stand up any one of those teammates up here, and they could probably explain it better than I can, but it goes like this. A company can achieve profits one of two ways. On the left side of the chart, new sales, and God knows we work that hard with sales and marketing and, and bringing in the right customers. Uh, all of that hard work. But in the case of Klein Steel, for every $33 that starts down that road and goes through the calculus of the P&L statement, $1 gets to the bottom line. That's business. The other way that we can make money is by cutting expenses. And the nice part about that is that for every dollar in expenses you cut, that drops to the bottom line dollar for dollar. Dollar for dollar. So in the case of safety, where a company like Klein Steel gets back a dividend check for, say, $400,000 because they haven't had any accidents, that's the equivalent of how many new dollars in sales to achieve the same effect. Try over $12 million. That's the equivalent of a company like Klein Steel in the first quarter we had $60,000 uh, in quality mistakes a small fraction of the total sales, but $60,000 in mistakes in quality. That's the equivalent of 60000 times 33 in new sales. That's a lot of money. That gets everybody's attention real fast. You could plug in inventory errors, any number of expenses you can plug in there that every member of the team controls one way or the other, and suddenly they're empowered. They're empowered to make a difference. And then you tie the profit sharing program with net profit and safety results and quality results and now suddenly things start to get aligned based on a strategy that the company has and goals that we've set for each other. We're holding each other accountable. And, I mean, this is a powerful concept that everybody gets. I talk about it all the time. I reel it back into real-life examples so people understand what we're doing. Klein Steel's in business to make money. 
to take care of ourselves and our families. This is the traditional model. You all, I suspect, have worked in an organization like that at one point or another. I found this on the Internet the other day. I couldn't believe it. It's perfect. That's the traditional model where, for some reason, somebody at the top has all the answers. And then there's a number of layers underneath that. And the guy at the top has one view of the world, and the guys at the bottom have a whole different view, and you can fill in the blank. That's not what we're about. That's not what we're trying to achieve. That's not decentralization and empowerment. And sadly, too many organizations are that. I've worked in them before. I couldn't stand them. I didn't want to get up in the morning to go to work. I had no fire. I had no passion. Because it'll suck the juices right out of you. And what I want to suggest to you today is that there's a better way to do it. And I suspect that I'm preaching to the choir. You wouldn't be a best plant. Uh, unless you understood this. It's about being a team member-centric organization. It's about reducing layers. It's about cross-functional teams coming together to accomplish great things. In my experience, that previous model, that traditional model, really does lead to sub-optimization and ultimately defeat. Ultimately defeat. True in the military, too, by the way. You know, the standard perception, I'm sure, is that the Army is a very traditional organization with lots of, of layers and, you know, the kind of picture that I showed previously. Not the case at all. Not in the organization I was part of, organizations that I was part of. We've, we've done a lot to grow this team member-centric culture. Give subordinate leaders and commanders the mission and intent and get the hell out of their way. Let them accomplish what they need to do. You know, it's all about building team members that, that want to seize the initiative, to act like an owner. Team members who understand that the work that they do in either bringing in new sales or reducing expenses has a dramatic impact on the future of the company. In my experience, team members can call the shots. I very rarely have had to put my finger in somebody's chest and say, you will do this. And I'm thinking of examples where American soldiers were crossing the line of departure into some very difficult and dangerous situations. I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to do that. Enable team members to set their own objectives. You know, it's all part of the assessment process. There's a way to do that and there's a, a way not to do it. And at the end of the day, leadership is about service. In my view, a leader is all about serving the people in the organization, to enabling them to be all they can be. It's about service. Here's a, here's a neat definition of discipline. I hope those in the back can read it. Can you? Put, put your hand up if you can. You can. Uh, I'm thinking back to July 1970, West Point, Plebe, Beast Barracks. Uh, I have to memorize all kinds of stuff for these sadistic upperclassmen that would make our life miserable if we couldn't recant that on, on demand. And at the time, I memorized it, and it really meant nothing to me. But over time, in successive positions uh, in the Army, as I started out as a very centralized leader, didn't trust anybody, uh, did it all myself, and then gradually developed through company, battalion, brigade, division, command, and you, you, you change. You modify your leadership styles. But this is fundamental right here. This idea that you treat everyone with dignity and respect. You know, it says the one mode or the other of dealing with subordinates springs from the corresponding spirit in the breast of the commander, leader. He or she, this was written in 1879, who feels the respect which is due to others cannot fail to inspire in them regard for himself or herself, while he or she who feels and hence manifests disrespect toward others, especially his juniors, cannot fail to inspire hatred against himself or herself. How, how absolutely true. You treat people with dignity and respect. Uh, you know, I, I've never worked for anyone who I would call my superior. I work for folks who are definitely senior to me by virtue of rank or age 
and conversely, the people that work for me are not necessarily junior. You know, they're there to be mentored and taught and brought up and empowered and given the resources they need to do what they have to do. All right, let me then trans- transition into the, what we call the six leadership principles. Uh, I'm a partner in an organization called Level 5 Associates. It's a couple of retired generals that sat down about three years ago and, and, and had some fun thinking about, okay, what does it all mean? Now that we've been in the Army for three decades and now that we've been in business for a while, what, what are the principles that transcend everything else? And it boiled down to these six right here. And I'm going to talk about each one of them in some detail and show you some pictures and concepts that kind of blend my experience in the military, in the Army, with my experience at Klein Steel. And by the way, we got the best military in the world. Bar none, hands down, unbelievable. Uh, we are blessed as Americans to be served by such incredible men and women. And, and if you don't think we don't have problems in, in the United States with respect to veterans, don't kid yourself. Uh, these kids are coming home from war, sometimes uh, more than three tours of a year each, uh, and, and they're having a hard time getting their self put back together. Some of them can't even find work. Twenty-four percent of veterans right now are unemployed, veterans of these wars. Uh, there's a PTSD problem post-traumatic stress disorder problem that is looming in a big way because we didn't pull together as a nation a full strategy to deal with going to war. So it's going to take a lot of work on the part of the VA and a whole bunch of community-based organizations to fix that. That's the subject of a whole other presentation. Six principles. Number one is to set the azimuth. You know, an organization has to know where it's going. Uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Kind of reminds me of U.S. foreign policy today. You've you got to understand that. It's got to be spelled out with mission, vision, values. You know, the culture defined. Uh, the hedgehog concept. I'll show you an example of that in a moment that, that we use at, at Klein Steel. It's fueling a sense of urgency in an organization. If you don't do that, people will be real busy doing what's not important. And the only way that I know to do that is to lay out in some detail and specificity with clarity what the organization's mission, vision, values, and culture is. At Klein Steel, we do that every year. We take three days and go off and spend the time to refine our strategy. And it's great debate. Ten or twelve of us in a room, interacting and really sorting out and laying out the azimuth for the organization for the next three years. That's important. That is time well spent. Because out of that comes our strategy, our shared goals, our shared vision of the future, our agreed mission statement, our vision. All of those things are so important. they got to be laid out. If you don't, you can't decentralize. You'll never get there. You're stuck on traditional. You'll never get there. So let me show you some examples real quickly. I'll I'll go through these at some speed. This is the Klein Steel mission statement. Officers in the Army go to school and learn how to write mission and intent, we call it, values or or vision. That's important. You've got to think through the who, the what, the why, and the how. In our case, two sentences that say it all. And any member of the team can relate those two sentences, not verbatim, but they got the concept down. They understand it. They understand what what we're all about. This is the company's vision statement. Remember, we do a three-year strategy, so it's all about what what do we want to achieve in the next three years. And here it is. And you can bet that each one of these is tied to a set of goals, very measurable, that we go after day in and day out. Best in class is important to us. Safety, accuracy, quality, on-time delivery, a steel service center. That better be pretty important. We're building a team member-centric organization, and there's a whole sub-strategy devoted to that. Five years ago, the first hire I made was a chief talent officer. And he is. Uh, Pat could have gone to work for any Fortune 500. That good, that well-connected. 
But, but he saw the fun that we're having at Klein Steel to build a team member-centric organization along the way, and we're blessed to have him on the team. That's how important this is, you know, building the right team and then making sure you've got the right teammates on the team so you can achieve this idea of a team member-centric organization. We're working on our distribution strategy. We're constantly streamlining, growing stronger. Here's our values. There's a lot on that sheet, and I don't apologize for that. Ten values that are really important to us, incredibly important to us. Every one of them is fundamental to who we are and whether or not we're going to achieve what we set out to do together. They're in alphabetical order. They start with, with account, accountability and end with teamwork. You know, values like candor, uh, values like dependability. Pretty hard to find some of these values in the young kids that are coming in trying to sign up for your company. But we, we, we have uh, built a, a very uh, deliberate process to weed out and find the best teammates. And that includes lots of, of interviews, three different sets of interviews just to get in the door, all kinds of assessments that one can take to predict behavior, uh, all the normal drug screening and background checks. It, it, it is a deliberate process to make sure that we hire only the best. Discipline is terribly important, this idea that you do the harder right rather than the easier wrong. That's a line in the cadet prayer that I've never forgotten. And you're, it's all about finding teammates that are hardwired with those values. And you set your chief talent officer the task to go figure out how to assess that with some clarity before you offer anybody employment with your team. Uh, here's our culture you know, that we all sign up for. You know, it's about doing the right thing in the absence of supervision. I'd much rather have teammates that ask forgiveness than permission. I'll show you why in a minute. You know, we learn from our mistakes. You bet you we make mistakes, but we learn from them. We do after-action reviews, and we don't repeat them. We get better. We change the procedures and the SOPs. We share our profits. We share our net profits. And we're building this team member-centric organization that's defined with decentralization, empowerment. It's a culture of performance. There are high expectations. Our voluntary turnover rate right now is 3.9%. Our involuntary turnover rate is a whole lot higher. Because you don't want to suffer fools on your team. When they don't cut the mustard, they're gone. Here's the hedgehog concept that we use. Everybody's probably read the book, Jim Collins, Good to Great. Ah, this is a great idea. It was a, the centerpiece of about a half a day discussion with the senior team to figure out what are we deeply passionate about, what are we best at, and what drives our engine, our economic engine. And that, that translated into mission and vision and values, an important concept that we found very useful. And then, finally, five Klein Steel imperatives. Uh, all tied to our strategy, all tied to goals, all measurable that we go after with, with daily, weekly, and monthly routines to make sure that we're meeting the standard. Companies, I think, have to have this. Set the azimuth. Now, let me show you an example from my experience in the Army related to setting the azimuth. And, and this is an operational concept for uh, what we did uh, in... Iraq, I'm sorry, in Iraq, yeah, I hit my, in Iraq, OIF2. Uh, lots of soldiers coming together, active duty, reserve component, you know, setting the azimuth, sorting out precisely what the mission is, uh, what the intent is, uh, being able to communicate this down to every soldier in that 22,000 man and woman formation, so they all understood what we were doing and how they fit into the big scheme. Uh, it, it has to be done. You've got to do it for your business. Uh, I would recommend that as a leader you sit down and, and you write out uh, what your leadership philosophy is. You've thought about it a lot by now, and you, you write that down. It's a page long, no more than that. And you get that out to all of your teammates. They need to understand where you're coming from. They need to understand what your philosophy is. And then you build on, on that with respect to strategy and mission and vision. 
It's about repeating yourself often. You have to do that as a leader. You've got to do what I'm doing right now, that is standing up in front of your team and, and talking a lot about what you're doing. This is a picture taken in February 2004 in Kuwait uh, before a battalion of engineers from the 30th Brigade of the North Carolina National Guard uh, was deployed into uh, north-central Iraq to conduct combat operations. First time I talked to these soldiers, and I don't remember exactly what I was saying on that day, but I suspect it was directly related to the operational concept. And they heard it from me and the subordinate commanders over and over and over again because the operation was very decentralized and we needed soldiers who understood the big picture. You, you have to talk to your, your, your teammates often, frequently. Uh, and, and some people don't like doing that. Uh, but it's important. It takes the average person seven times to hear something before it sinks in. And I believe that's true. And so, therefore, the below average takes 20 times. I don't know. But there's always some time, there's always somebody in the room who's hearing it from the first, for the first time or who's understanding it for the first time. Communication is hard. And setting that azimuth doesn't work unless everybody understands the azimuth. Number two is all about listening. You know, this idea that you never pass up an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. Good leaders intently listen. And it's an acquired skill. You need to be listening to the great ideas that your teammates have. You need to set them up for success. And part of that's listening. There's nobody in this room who has all the answers. Nobody. But collectively, imagine what we can do together. Imagine what we can do together. You know, ask yourself all the time, who else needs to know? In every command post I've had, there's a sign that says that. It says it in Klein Steel today. Who else needs to know? Because every time I, I hit an important decision point or I see a, a, a piece of information, I, I always take a second or two to think, who else needs to get a copy of this? And there's always somebody else. Because what you're doing is empowering them to do their jobs. You're empowering them with information so they can do it better. It's about listening to your teammates. It's about knowing them. This is a favorite picture of mine, a young soldier out of the 1st Infantry Division. He's receiving the Purple Heart. And it's about knowing those guys. It's eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball contact to the extent that you can on a personal level. Personal level. Because at the end of the day, that's what leadership is. You can't do it behind your email screen. You can't do it from your desk. You've got to be out with the troops. Number three is this concept of, of decentralization, trusting and empowering. Most leaders that I know are insecure to the point where they won't do this. I was certainly that way, no question about it, until about the time I took command of a battalion of 800 soldiers. And the complexity was such that I realized that if I really wanted to unleash the creative power of this organization, I better embrace decentralization. You know, you delegate to the appropriate level and get out of the way. It's about building a culture of learning. It's okay to make a mistake. After all, it's how we learn. It's how we get better. That's how we adjust our procedures and SOPs so they become codified in the organization's culture and we don't repeat the mistakes. SOPs are really important. Process is important. Mentoring is expected and required. I had leaders at Klein Steel five years ago who had no idea that one of their responsibilities was to mentor their teammates. Most small and uh, medium-sized businesses don't have a budget to support institutional training. Or at least you don't think you do. But I think it's important. At Klein Steel, we have what's called Klein Steel University and its courses of instruction. Uh, taught for the different levels within the organization. Some of it I do, some of it other leaders in the organization do, some of it's contracted out to consultants, but it's important to bring everybody along and know what their long-term goals are and, and build them and prepare them so they can one, at one point uh, step up in the organization. Who's your bench? Who would replace you today if you got hit by a bus? Who would replace every member of your senior staff today if they came down with some uh, threatening illness? 
Those are the kinds of questions you've got to answer. And you and I have an obligation as leaders to be building that bench, to be mentoring and teaching and giving people the experiences that they need. Here's a great example, I think, of decentralization. This is the first Gulf War. Uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf, some of you were probably there. Raise your hand if you were in that war. Don't see anybody. That there, I'm sorry, right there. There we were, out in the deserts of Kuwait for far too many months, six or seven. We finally crossed the line of departure with a fairly complex scheme of maneuver. That was it. And every one of those axes is an Army, Marine Corps, or Allied division of 20, 25,000 soldiers and hundreds of combat vehicles and Apaches and even more 50,000-gallon fuel tanker trucks moving out like that. Boy, if General Schwarzkopf and my division commander, Barry McCaffrey, didn't believe in decentralization, we'd still be up there sorting ourselves out. Because at the end of the day, when you cross the line of departure... When you commit to a new product line, when you commit to opening a new branch, when you're doing something to grow your business, you're acquiring somebody else, the minute you cross the line of departure, that's what happens. Huh? The enemy has a vote. The economic environment has a vote. The competition has a vote. Things change real quick. And if you're not agile enough, and if you haven't thought through the branches and sequel of your plan... Uh, and if you haven't set your team up to be decentralized, empowered to make decisions without you, uh, focused on asking forgiveness, not permission, then you may not win the battle. The next idea is do the right thing when no one's looking. Uh, and this is hard. You know, doing the right thing, uh, the harder right rather than the easier wrong. General Steiner told a bunch of us in 1997 when we got promoted to Brigadier General, yeah, great job. Uh, number one, there's probably a hundred guys that could be promoted instead of you and do just as fine a job. But also remember that as you go up that flagpole, the higher you get, the more your butt shows. <laughs> I was stunned. This learned four-star general, what's he saying? He, he, it was so right. Think about it. People are watching you and your organization seven days a week, 24 hours a day, period. They're, they're measuring you. Are you walking the talk with your values? And if you're not, you've just undermined your entire organization. The values in the front lobby are meaningless, and the organization will not go in the direction that you think it will. Uh, don't ever ask your teammates to do anything you yourself wouldn't do. In, in, in the Army, the officers eat last. And that's the philosophy at Klein Steel. Uh, walk by a problem without stopping and having the moral courage to fix it. You've just accepted uh, a new and lower standard that will be very difficult to change in the future. Have you grown your leaders to have that moral courage? Tow motor goes by and the guy doesn't have the seat belt on. Whoa. How many times do you just turn a blind eye? Integrity, non-negotiable. Persistence matters. Great example of this, doing the right thing when no one's looking. Uh, I commanded the 2nd Brigade of the 1st Armored Division in 1995-1997, and we were one of the two brigades that went into Bosnia-Herzegovina to implement the terms of the Dayton Peace Accord. This is my lead tank of the cavalry squadron crossing that famous Saba River Bridge into a very... Uh, ambiguous situation with uh, Serbs and Croats and Muslims killing each other, killing fields uh, in the dead of winter. Spread out over an area the size of the state of Vermont. And I had to trust in my subordinate leaders down to squad leader level to do the right thing because I could not be there with them. So we spent a lot of time preparing them for that. Tough situation. They did magnificently. Uh, this is the brigade command post in the, in the Republic of Srpska, not far from Hans Piazak, right next to the, to the underground tunnel that we thought Blodich was using. Spent a year looking for the guy. But that's how we live. My tent's in the foreground. You live like your troops, doing the right thing when no one's looking. Number five is one in charge, take charge. This idea that leaders need to lead, follow, or get out of the way. In the absence of orders, attack. 
Ask forgiveness, not permission. Build that team member-centric organization. Part of it's getting the right people on the bus. That's hard. Easy to talk about getting rid of people who aren't measuring up. Very difficult to do it. But great organizations find a way to get it done. We're, we're recruiting and interviewing at Kleinsteel every single day. There's not a week that goes by that I'm personally not interviewing about three people. Constantly looking, constantly massaging what's out there to make sure that we got the very best people that aren't afraid to fail, who are risk takers, all within the construct of a strategy and processes that are well defined. I found over time that you never shoot the messenger. That first report is always wrong. Always. Usually way wrong. Have the combat patience, the tactical patience. Don't overreact. Go get, go get the facts. Let's see what really happened. Teamwork, setting a bias for action in your organization. A great example of that, back to Iraq, OIF-2, 2004. The green is where the 1st Infantry Division was. Size of the area of the state of West Virginia, 22,000 troops over about 25 different locations. So this idea of when in charge, take charge was really important. Building that team, a division who was together for essentially three years. Magic. Because it's all about that corporal in the turret of that Bradley who's empowered, who knows what the plan is. You've set the azimuth, you've, communicate, you've communicated that azimuth in spades that these team members trusted each other and they trusted the leadership in the division. So, number six, and the final, I think, important leadership principle is balance is key. You know, uh, I've seen organizations where a leader that was out of balance virtually destroyed the organization. And now with all of our tools called BlackBerry and everything else, it only gets worse. It's not about working harder, it's about working smarter. Setting a clear azimuth, this is important. Without a clear azimuth, you can't delegate. And without delegation, you cannot achieve balance. You're building stronger organizations by delegating. And oh, by the way, that gives you, the leader, an opportunity to spend some time with your family. Think about it. Don't take yourself too seriously. In my experience, effective leaders, the ones that I can think of, the mentors in my life, have always had a life. And they've had incredible organizations that could accomplish anything. So, let's wrap this up and see what your questions are. When against all odds... That's what this is, leadership in tough times, leadership in any time. It's knowing yourself and knowing your competition. Know what drives your engine. Set your azimuth. You make your own luck day in and day out. I love this story. In the morning, the gazelle wakes up in Africa. And it asks, it, it asks it's himself or herself, gosh, I wonder if I can run fast enough today to not get caught by the lion and get eaten. And the lion wakes up in the same vicinity and says, geez, I wonder if I can run fast enough today to catch the gazelle so I don't starve. And in my view, what that tells all of us, if we're not running when we wake up, we're doomed. It's a competitive world, isn't it? Make your own luck. Uh, the takeaways are, uh, as I think about this, leadership is a developed skill. It's a journey. You're not going to uh, learn it by reading the books. You learn it through practice, uh, school of hard knocks, trial and errors, finding the right mentor, getting associated with the right group like Vistage to help you along the way. Just reading the book is not enough. It's part of the answer, but it is by no means the whole answer. Uh, how we lead our organizations is terribly important. The organization will take on your personality. Always does. Uh, it's not about I and me, it's we and us. We and us. Decentralization, in my experience, has created unbelievable results. Walk the talk with your values, lead from the front, never do anything you would not ask a teammate to do yourself. Be persistent, be a servant leader. The team members recognize servant leadership. They know it when they see it. 
They also know a self-serving leader who's at the top of the chain of a traditional organization. So here's some questions for you as you ponder all this. What is your leadership style? Is it a traditional style or is it more of a team member centric? Are you you the person that wants to to decentralize or do you want to centralize and keep it all to yourself? Do you trust? Do you allow people to fail so they can get better? Maybe most importantly, do you walk the talk with your values? Because whether you like it or not, you're being measured every minute of every day. So let me stop there and and see, uh, see what your questions are. Thank you. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, my long point is I've actually retired Air Force, uh, served 20 years active duty, uh, so I can certainly relate to the transition uh, into civilian life. Uh, upon retirement uh, from the U.S. Army, what did you consider your greatest uh, weakness in terms of transitioning into the civilian community as a leader? Great question, and I was trying to flip to a slide, and I'm not going to make it happen. Uh, Could you all go to the slide that that shows that profit and loss statement? Uh, That is the answer, that profit and loss statement. To understand the dynamics of business. You know, in the Army, I'd gone to school. I was a trained financial manager. I'd done jobs budgeting for large organizations. What, What I didn't understand, and we're getting to it here pretty quick, is this chart... Well, it's that chart that showed you can, you can come to profit one of two ways. I didn't understand that, that aspect of cut your expenses, how important that is. What happens between gross profit and net profit? Fundamentally important. And, and what you can do as an organization with the right teammates to, to, to reduce your cost to serve and have a dramatic impact. Here it comes. It's the next one, I think. Uh, and have a dramatic impact on your bottom line, this one right here. I didn't understand that. It was an aha moment. It's a simple concept. Very simple. Uh, but since then, five years later, this concept is part of the very fabric of Klein Steel. We've, we've taken over a, uh, or, or just got linked up eight months ago with a new activities-based costing model called Waypoint Analytics. Unbelievable what that's done to us. This empowerment... Uh, the team member centric model that I've described and everybody involved focused on reducing our cost to serve and being successful. Incentive programs all tailored on not gross profit but net profit. So it's opened our eyes to be able to really differentiate between a good customer and a bad customer, profitable customer, unprofitable, profitable co- uh, product line, unprofitable product line. Uh, it, it opened horizons that I didn't know about. Great question, though. Thanks. Yes, please. I, I find it uh, tremendous that you take so much time finding talent. Finding talent and, and cultivating talent. You just talked about spending uh, time, uh, maybe three folks uh, a week. Can you tell me a little bit about what you look for as you're identifying new talent for the organization? Yeah, that, what a great question that is. You know, how do you interview somebody with, with piercing questions that, that get beyond uh, the qualifiers to what's quantifiable? And, and there's, there's a lot of people that, that have helped me with that and, and helped our organization with that. Uh, for example, before we go after hiring a certain level of leader, we, we really defined the job description uh, and what attributes that we're looking for before we even start. And, and then we divvy out uh, amongst the interviewers, you ask this question, you, you probe here, I'll ask this pro- uh, question, I'll probe here, and so forth. And then we come back together afterwards and compare notes. In addition, we've, we've gone to school on a lot of predictive uh, assessments that can get at uh, a a person's values and propensity to act the way you want them to act. And, and we find those extremely helpful. 
And there's a bunch of them out there, but it's, it, it, it gets beyond does the person have the skills for a specific job, more about the soft skills that are incredibly important. And, and it's hard in an interview to really get to the answer. You know, we, we'll interview somebody three times before we hire them. The first time is a telephone interview. And that screening process by the HR department gets rid of a lot. Then we bring them in, and, and they're hired by uh, some of the supervisors to determine whether or not that's somebody they want on a team. At this point, they haven't even seen the inside of the operation. Many of those people never get to the next level. The third level, they come back for a more intense grilling and, an, and then a tour process to expose more of the organization. And along the way, we're watching them all the time. And then they take the assessments. We're not going to pay for the assessments for those that don't get through the three layers of scrutiny before we say, would you like to work for us? Yes? Neil Academy grad? Yes, yes. How are you? Good, good. Thanks. Well, uh, my question is to, to follow up on the, the interviews. Uh, obviously, you're spending a lot of time finding talent, finding performers for uh, possibly future leaders for the company. What's more important to you? Someone with specific industry experience or someone with raw talent, raw leadership without industry experience? Uh, I'll, I'll err on the side of raw talent any time. Uh, there's a bit of a different answer depending on what skill you're hiring for, but in general, I'll err on the side of raw talent, values, uh, work ethic, uh, intelligence, those kinds of things, because I can teach someone to do about anything at Klein Steel within 100 days. Yes. One more, please. Over here on your far right. Yes, sir. Um, you, uh, you mentioned in your presentation that 24% of the veterans coming back from the last two wars are unemployed. Right. Uh, what can we as employers do? Are you engaged in any activities to address that? And that seems like not a real nice way to say thank you for their service. That's a great question. And, uh, you know, we as a nation went to war without an integrated interagency strategy uh, to do what we did in 2001, or frankly, to do what we're doing today. We, we had a great Department of Defense operational strategy, absolutely. That department knows how to do that. But in terms of the holistic picture of the U.S. government, there is no process to do that today, which is a scary thought. And, and so we went to war without thinking through the long-term ramifications of what happens when we go to war for 10 years with hundreds and thousands of Americans, 30% of them come home with post-traumatic stress disorder. Oftentimes that doesn't manifest itself for three to five years after they get home. Only 39% of veterans ever walk into a VA facility. That means 61% don't. I, I could go on and on. I'm very active in veterans affairs in upstate New York. Uh, PTSD is a real problem. And they, these, these youngsters need to be found. They need to be brought in for care and therapy. They need job transition. Uh, and, and you and I as employers need to give th these great veterans an opportunity. I'm not saying to hire them just because they're a veteran. Absolutely not. There's bad apples in every barrel. Uh, but, but oftentimes what we have found, uh, going through that process that I described, that, that, that these kids, uh, young sergeants and officers that have been through significant training, Leadership development, you know, they understand values, discipline. They can add a lot to your organization. So I, I would just recommend that it, uh, if you're not doing it, go back to your local area and figure out who is the advocate for veterans. There, there may be a veterans outreach center. You know, there's a county veteran service officer. There's some way to link in to find these wonderful Americans who at the moment are coming back, often in the reserve, uh, their old job's no longer there, and they're in trouble. Oftentimes they self-medicate in an in-law's basement, and they're going down fast. And uh, what we can't do is, is to repeat what we did to the Vietnam veterans. Great question, though. Thank you.